News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, Murder and Cannibalism. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at three cases of cannibalism originating from the Arctic exploration forays and from the high seas. The Franklin expedition of 1845 to attempt to find a northwest passage was doomed nine years later just how doomed the crew had become becomes apparent from their corpse discoveries the greeley expedition of 1881 to 1884 which attempted to establish a scientific research station in the canadian arctic archipelago was also doomed days away from the inevitable death of the last remaining survivors they are rescued but some gruesome admissions come to light. A last case from 1888 involves the murder of an 18-year-old lad at sea and his subsequent dismemberment and consumption by the other members of the crew. Questions of morality versus survival becomes a key issue in court when assessing the culpability of the murderers. Three cases of extremely harsh situations leading to murder and cannibalism is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Case 1. The Franklin Expedition 1854 The Franklin Expedition, led by Sir John Franklin, set sail from England in 1845 with the ship's HMS Erebus and HMS Terror in an attempt to discover the Northwest Passage, a navigable sea route that would connect the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans through the Arctic. The two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, were both heavily reinforced and equipped with the then latest technology for polar exploration. However, Despite the initial optimism, the Franklin expedition faced numerous challenges and difficulties. The crew of 129 men and officers vanished, never to be seen again. The last confirmed contact with the expedition occurred in July 1845, when it was spotted by whalers in Baffin Bay. After that, the expedition disappeared without a trace, leading to one of the great mysteries in maritime history. With much pressure from Captain Franklin's wife, expeditions were sent out to try to discover what had happened to the men and to recover any survivors. Several expeditions were sent out by the Admiralty, as well as a £20,000 reward placed on offer but the recovery expeditions were unsuccessful. In 1854, with an overland expedition to discover the fate of the doomed Franklin expedition, Dr John Ray found evidence of some of the victims. From the Berkshire Chronicle, the 28th of October 1854, the Hudson Bay Arctic Searching Expedition the following report from Dr. Ray, who is in charge of the Hudson Bay Arctic Expedition in search of Sir John Franklin, has been promulgated. To the Secretary of the Admiralty, Repulse Bay, July 29. Sir, I have the honour to mention for the information of the Lords Commissioners of the Admiralty that during my journey over the ice and snows this spring, with the view of completing the survey of the west shore of Boothia, I met with Eskimos in Pelly Bay, from one of whom I learnt that a party of white men had perished for want of food some distance to the westward, and not far beyond a large river containing many falls and rapids. Subsequently, further particulars were received and a number of articles purchased, which places the fate of a portion, if not all, of the then survivors of Sir John Franklin's long-lost party 
beyond a doubt, a fate as terrible as the imagination can conceive. The substance of the information obtained at various times and from various sources was as follows. In the spring, four winters past, spring 1850, a party of white men amounting to about forty were seen travelling southward over the ice and dragging a boat with them by some Eskimos who were killing seals near the north shore of King William's Land, which is a large island. None of the party could speak the Eskimo language intelligibly, but by signs the natives were made to understand that their ship or ships had been crushed by ice and that they were now going to where they expected to find deer to shoot. From the appearance of the men, all of whom except one officer looked thin, they were then supposed to be getting short of provisions, and they purchased a small seal from the natives. At a later date, the same season, but previous to the breaking up of the ice, the bodies of some thirty persons were discovered on the continent and five on an island near it, about a long day's journey to the northwest of a large stream. Some of the bodies have been buried, probably those of the first victims of famine. Some were in a tent or tents, others under the boat, which had been turned over to form a shelter, and several lay scattered about in different directions. Of those found on the island, one was supposed to have been an officer, as he had a telescope strapped over his shoulder, and his double gun lay underneath him. From the mutilated state of many of the corpses and the contents of the kettles, it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last resource, cannibalism, as means of prolonging existence. There appeared to have been abundant stock of ammunition. The powder was emptied in a heap on the ground by the bodies, out of the kegs or cans containing it, and a quantity of ball and shot was found below the high water mark, having been probably left on the ice close to the beach. There must have been a number of watches, compasses, telescopes, guns, several double barreled all of which appear to have been broken up, as I saw pieces of those different articles with the Eskimo, and together with some silver spoons and forks, I purchased as many as I could get. None of the Eskimos with whom I conversed had seen the white men, nor had they ever been at the place where the bodies were found, but had their information from those who had been there and who had seen the party when travelling. The cannibalism charge of the now legendary Franklin expedition did not sit well with the public, the Admiralty or the press. The captain's widow, Lady Franklin, who had been so forceful in generating sympathy for the plight of her husband and his crew, was appalled. She enlisted the help of Charles Dickens to slander Dr. Ray and his findings, the argument being that it was the Inuit who had feasted on the bodies of the men, not the crew, cannibalizing themselves because no Englishman would ever do that. The slander against Dr. Ray had a lifelong impact on his social standing. Postscript in 2014, the wreck of HMS Erebus was discovered by the Canadian Victoria Strait Expedition, led by Parks Canada, using advanced sonar technology. Two years later, in 2016, HMS Terror was found in Terror Bay, significantly farther north than where the experts had initially expected to locate the ship. Both well-preserved wrecks provided a wealth of information about the fate of the expedition. Artifacts recovered from the site, as well as the study of remains and ship structures, shed additional light on the harsh conditions 
faced by the crew, including lead poisoning from poorly sealed food tins. The exact reasons for the failure of the Franklin expedition remain a subject of historical investigation. Factors such as harsh Arctic conditions, navigational challenges, scurvy and potentially lead poisoning are believed to have contributed to the tragedy. The findings of Dr. Ray of evidence of cannibalism were proved to be accurate. Case 2 the Greeley Expedition, 1881 to 1884. The Greeley Expedition, officially known as the Lady Franklin Bay Expedition, was a United States Army-led scientific venture to the Arctic, led by Lieutenant Adolphus W. Greeley. And the expedition took place from 1881 to 1884 and aimed to establish a scientific research station in Lady Franklin Bay, located on Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. The primary goal of the expedition was to gather scientific data, particularly related to meteorology, magnetism and other natural phenomena. The mission also aimed to surpass previous achievements in reaching high latitudes. The expedition faced numerous challenges, including extreme cold, limited resources, and difficulties in obtaining regular resupplies due to the harsh Arctic conditions. The team endured harsh winters and shortages of food, resulting in malnutrition and other health issues. As conditions worsened, the U.S. government attempted to send relief expeditions to rescue the stranded members of the Lady Franklin Bay expedition. However, these efforts faced their own set of challenges, including difficulties in navigating the treacherous Arctic waters. The rescue mission known as the Greeley Relief Expedition, led by Winfield Scott Greeley, reached Ford Conger in 1884. Unfortunately, they found only seven survivors out of the original 25-member party. The survivors, including Greeley, had endured extreme hardships, including starvation and exposure to the elements. Some 30 years after the sensational Franklin expedition, with claims of evidence of cannibalism. The story of this having taken place gripped the papers on both sides of the Atlantic. We pick up the story from after the rescue of the survivors. From the Liverpool Echo, the 15th of August, 1884, the cannibalism of Arctic explorers. Lieutenant Greeley has sent his official report in which he states that Private Henry was shot for continued thieving. He says that on the 24th of March, when the whole party was nearly asphyxiated, Henry stole two pans of bacon. Later on, he was found drunk, having stolen some liquor intended for general use. The men then clamoured for his life, but Lieutenant Greeley spared him on that occasion, at the same time issuing orders that he should be shot if again detected stealing stores. On the 6th of June, Henry not only stole some shrimps, but visited without permission the winter camp and stole certain seal skin reserved for food. He was then ordered to be shot and was executed by three of the most reliable men, all the party concurring in the justice of the sentence. A telegram from Rochester, New York State, published this evening, says that the body of Lieutenant Killingsbury, which was buried at that place, had been exhumed and examined by physicians who testify that certain parts of the skin and muscles had been removed and that the flesh had been cut away by a sharp instrument. The body weighed about 50 pounds. The telegram adds that this established beyond question that the survivors 
were compelled to resort to cannibalism to sustain life. Considered somewhat more comprehensible in 1884, the requirement to eat fellow colleagues in order to survive than it was in 1854, the news was still considered tremendously shocking. The bodies are exhumed and examined, and the revelation of cannibalism is confirmed. From the Manchester Evening News, the 22nd of August 1884, the cannibalism by Arctic explorers. The New York Times of the 13th inst, referring to its disclosures made the previous issue respecting the acts of cannibalism committed by members of the Greeley expedition, says, Very few of the crew of the two relief vessels which reached Greeley's desolate camp were permitted to see the bodies of the dead. When their condition was discovered and the horrible fact was apparent that cannibalism had been resorted to, the officers of the two vessels took every precaution to keep the fact from the sailors. The officers, assisted by only a few sailors, uncovered the bodies and prepared the remains for removal to the ships. The gravel thrown over them was only a few inches in thickness at any place, while the heads and feet of several were exposed. The officers carefully shielded the bodies, and it was this act which first aroused the suspicion of many of the sailors. Blankets were taken to the camp from the bear, and in them the officers rolled the bodies. These coverings of blankets were never removed, and when the iron caskets were prepared at St. John's, they received the remains without a single blanket having been disturbed, and the lids were riveted on the coffins. Everything was done in a careful, painstaking, reverent way, and only to the officers and a few sailors, not more than three or four, was it known for a certainty that the bodies were mutilated. In handling the remains after they had been prepared by the officers, the exceeding lightness of some of them was remarked upon by the seamen, and a doubt was more than once expressed if more than half of body was within the covering. This was noticed in removing the bodies from the shallow graves in the gravel at the Cape, and again when they were placed in tanks on the Bear and Thetis. The disclosure made by the unearthing of the bodies of the dead was generally discussed by the crews of all the vessels on the homeward trip. Making due allowance for the imagination of the sailors, the statements which they made before silence was enjoyed showed that terrible scenes must have been enacted by the famished men in the Greeley camp during the many long months that famine was with them. The officers of the vessels who alone can tell in full detail the condition of the dead when found refused to speak at all on the subject. Lieutenant Crawford, in command of the Bear as first officer, declined to have anything to say. Captain Coffin of the Alert also refused to talk on the subject, as did many officers seen. They all seemed to feel that the report of the expedition having been made by the Navy Department would therefore render themselves liable to court-martial if anything was said. This same feeling extends to the crew which stand in the same relative position to the officers of the vessels as the officers to the department. Said one intelligent sailor, the few who have seen the bodies had no backwardness at first in telling their condition. Those who had not seen them knew from the first that something was wrong by the way the officers screened them from view. If I saw the bodies, I am not at liberty to speak of their condition. Others who saw them stated that portions of the flesh had been cut away from different parts. I am satisfied as to what occurred in the camp, but I cannot say anything about it. 
Some of the visitors at the Navy Yard seem to wonder that the facts had not been appeared before and have taken it for granted when the condition of the Greeley party was first reported that cannibalism had been resorted to. It is more than probable that when all the details of the story are known, Dr. Octave Parvi, the surgeon of the expedition, will be found to have shared the same or very similar fate to that of young Charles Henry. The death of both men are entered under the same date on the ship's journal. Nothing is said about Henry being shot. The British press sent over one of their reporters to interview Lieutenant Greeley, who freely admits to cannibalism having taken place. From the Derby Daily Telegraph, the 3rd of September, 1884. Cannibalism by Arctic Explorers. Lieutenant Greeley's Statements. The Daily Chronicle correspondent telegraphing from Montreal states, I have today had the opportunity of interviewing Lieutenant Greeley, with whom I had a very interesting conversation. I found him a tall, pleasant-looking man, he was dressed in a white flannel suit and wore spectacles, possibly from the effects of the perpetual glare of the snow. The lieutenant bears traces in his appearance of his terrible voyage. His skin has become the colour of the Eskimo, but his flesh looks soft and puffy like the flesh on a baby's face, rather than the robust appearance characteristic of the hardy sailor. Lieutenant Greeley has a musical voice and his manner is slightly academical. Naturally, our conversation turned upon the vexed question of cannibalism. Lieutenant Greeley admits, frankly, that it was practised by some of his followers, but he sternly maintains that it was not general. Whatever was done in this way was done without his knowledge or consent. He believes that the bodies that were discovered were cut up by the doctor who is now dead and were the subject of what he called scientific butchery. He is maintained in this opinion by American physicians who believe they see evidence in support of it in the scientific manner in which the flesh has been removed. Greeley declares that the sufferings which the little party underwent were terrible. He can blame no one for proceeding to extremities under such enormous pressure. When they were found by the rescuing party, he himself was actually dying, and another 43 hours would have seen the end of the few survivors. Lieutenant Greeley admits that the German, Henry, was shot, as has already been stated but he did not know that he was eaten. For his own part, he affirms that he never took human flesh knowingly. The doctor tried to keep him up when sinking, but he cannot, of course, tell what they gave him in his exhausted condition. If he ate human flesh, it was in ignorance. He states that the health of the explorers was, on the whole, good and was in fact only impaired by the starvation they endured. Only one man died from actual disease during their voyage. Turning to the more scientific part of their expedition, Lieutenant Greeley said the boat voyage to Cape Congo by Lieutenant Sabine was the most remarkable of its kind ever recorded. It abounded in brilliant exploits and stirring adventures, he expressed warm thanks for the tokens of sympathy which had reached him from England in the form of numberless kinds of letters. The lieutenant will not again try his fortunes and risk his life amongst the polar seas. He has promised his wife and he will not return to those perilous regions. Postscript Despite the admittance of cannibalism, although Greeley himself adamantly stated that he himself had not partaken. The survivors were welcomed as heroes with a parade. 
there were no trials regarding murder or worse. Case 3, the Mignonette case, as it was referred, created a difficult situation for British maritime law in 1884. Cannibalism was freely admitted, which necessitated the prerequisite murder. What was murder is the question that the law must grapple with. From the Express and Echo this 6th of November 1884, the case of the Mignonette, Dudley and Stevens on trial, the verdict. Baron Huddleston took his seat at 10.30 this morning, a more than usual interest attached to the business of the day, it being generally known that the occasion was set apart for the trial of the survivors of the Mignonette. A crowd gathered about the precincts of the court for some considerable time before the proceedings commenced, and the space allotted to the public was crowded very soon after the doors were open. Thomas Dudley and Edwin Stevens were indicted for that they, being subjects of Our Lady the Queen on the high seas, did feloniously, willfully, and of malice and our forethought, kill and murder Richard Parker on the 25th of July, 1884. In opening the case, the prosecution stated that it became his duty to lay the facts of the extraordinary and painful case before them. Sad to submit, he regretted to say without doubt or hesitation that the prisoners at the bar were guilty by the law of this country of the murder of Richard Parker. It would be idle in him to suppose that they had not heard and read of the sad story of those men, and he was sure they must have felt as none indeed could fail to feel the deepest compassion and sympathy for them in their appalling suffering. But feelings of that kind must not be allowed to operate upon their minds to free them from the responsibility of finding a verdict according to law and evidence. Considerations of sympathy and compassion, however, and the shocking and terrible sufferings which they had undoubtedly undergone would be urged as a most powerful plea for the remission, in this case, of the extreme penalty of the law. But they could not, he took it upon himself to tell them, be considered by them in coming to a conclusion as to whether or not, by the law of England, those men were guilty or not of the crime for which they stood charged. He thought he should best do his duty if he laid before them in the shortest and simplest words the history of the case, and when he had done that, if, subject to correction, he explained to them what, upon the part of the Crown, he maintained to be the law of England in regard to the facts. In May of the present year, the yacht Mignonette, 19 tons burden, was brought by a gentleman in Australia. He was anxious that the vessel should be navigated from this country to Australia, and for that purpose he engaged a crew consisting of Dudley, Captain, Stevens, Mate, Brooks, Seaman, and Richard Parker, a boy. Dudley was 31 years old, Stevens 36, Brooks, to whom he should call before them, 39, and Parker, 18. That was the crew which manned the Mignonette on her voyage from Southampton to Sydney. They started on the 19th of May. The yacht was a small one, but Captain Dudley appeared to have been of the opinion that it was a craft in which it was safe to navigate the wide ocean between England and Australia. All went well until the 1st of July when they arrived at Madeira, where they stopped to take in necessary provisions, and started again on the 22nd. The weather became unfavourable between the 22nd and the 5th, and upon the 5th of July it was thick and a fresh gale was blowing about 
half past four in the afternoon, when Captain Dudley thought it was safer to heave to, and was about to do so for the night or until the weather had altered. A heavy sea struck the boat on her starboard bow and laid the starboard side completely open. The water rushed in. There was just in time to cut loose the one boat with which the mignonette was provided and to put on board her a chronometer, a sextant and whatever provision the crew could match in the moment that was left to them. The three men and the boy got into the boat and before five minutes had passed, the mignonette sank beneath the waters. There those poor men were. They were in latitude 27, longitude 10 west of the meridian of Greenwich. They were in an open sea, in an open boat 14 feet long, and all that they had succeeded in taking with them in the shape of provisions were two tins of turnips. They had no water. Dudley had shouted to Parker to throw a vessel containing water from the yacht to the boat. Unfortunately, it fell short of the boat, and the result was had two tins of turnips and no water. Four days elapsed, during which they appeared to have eaten next to nothing. They subsisted as well as they could on the turnip. On the fourth day a turtle was captured, and upon that turtle they sustained existence until the eleventh day after the shipwreck, drinking the turtle's blood. From the eleventh day until the eighteenth they appeared to have had nothing to eat and were reduced to the most fearful straits, with reference to the fact that they had nothing to drink. On the sixteenth day, or rather before, Captain Dudley appeared to have suggested to Brooks and Stevens, after the turtle had been finished, that they should cast lots as to which of them should die to save the life of the others. Brooks set his face against the suggestion, and so did Stevens. Brooks said, Let us all die together, if we are to die. I don't want to kill anyone, and I don't wish to be killed myself. The suggestion as to casting lots, therefore, fell to the ground. But upon the eighteenth day, Captain Dudley came to the conclusion that something must be done. And what was to be done? He had a consultation with Stevens in which they both spoke of the fact that they had wives and families of their own. And in the end, Captain Dudley suggested that it would be better to take the life of the boy Parker in order to save the other three lives. Parker, according to the evidence, would be laid before them, had become weaker than the others, or at all events, in the opinion of the other men, he was weaker on the sixteenth day, and he appeared from the sixteenth to the nineteenth day to have been in a state of the utmost prostration. Captain Dudley, having made that suggestion on the eighteenth day, it was agreed between Stevens and Dudley that if, when the morning sun rose on the 19th with no sail in sight and no rain falling, that Parker should be killed. The morning of the day came, the horizon was searched in vain, no sail appeared, and there had been no rain. Brooke, who therefore had been taking his place at the tiller, stepped forward, he appeared to have known or guessed what was about to be done. He could not bear to see it done, and he stepped forward and covered his head with his oilskin coat. Stevens replaced him at the helm. The boy at that time was lying at the bottom of the boat, about three feet from Stevens, and Dudley was in the middle of the boat. Captain Dudley stepped up to the boy. The poor lad, it appeared, was conscious at the time. Dudley said, Your time is come, my lad. What, me, sir? asked the boy. Yes, said Captain Dudley, and then, with a pea-knife which he held in his hand, he cut the neck of Richard Parker, and, and in a moment all was over. The blood which flowed from the wound was drunk by the three men.
When the deed was done, Dudley and Stevens commenced to drink the blood, and Brooks came from the forepart of the boat and obtained his share. And then, for the next four days of their voyage, they subsisted upon his flesh. On the fourth day, Brooks at last discovered a sail. It was the Montezuma, a Brazilian vessel, which fortunately saw the unhappy men and took them on board. Stevens and Dudley were too weak to walk on board, but were taken from the boat with ropes, and Brooks was just able to drag himself onto the vessel without assistance. They were treated with kindness and sailed for the remainder of the voyage on the Montezuma, all at last arrived at Falmouth on the 6th of September last. Upon their arrival they all made voluntary statements to the receiver of customs. The men made no secret of what had been done. It was true that the traces of what they had done were visible when the boat was taken aboard the Montezuma, but there could be no doubt that the men made no secret of what they had done and what they conceived they had a right to do. They made statements on oath from which a great many facts which had been detailed were drawn. Captain Dudley also made written statements which would be read. One of these statements detailed at length the whole of the facts from leaving Southampton to the time of their being picked up, and there were shorter statements detailing the facts of the murder of Parker, and it was from them that the evidence of Brooks that the circumstances of the case, as narrated, had been drawn. Now came the question in this case, a question of great importance, of interest, and as far as he knew, a question which only could be answered in one way. These men were charged with murder, but what was murder? The judges had little choice but to convict Thomas Dudley and Edward Stevens. Brooks having been acquitted. From the Lichfield Mercury, the 12th of December, 1884. The case of cannibalism at sea. The case of the Minionette on Thursday week came before five judges to decide whether the killing of the boy Parker to save the other survivors from starvation amounted to murder. The accused men, Thomas Dudley and Edward Stevens, were ordered into court. On their behalf, counsel argued that the killing of the boy for the purpose of obtaining food was justified by the terrible necessity to which they were reduced, but the Attorney General submitted that what they did amounted to murder. Lord Coleridge said the defence raised was novel and startling, and the opinion of the court was that unless it could be shown to be otherwise, the act of the accused was murder. After a long argument, the Lord Chief Justice said the conviction must be affirmed, and their lordships would state their reasons on the Tuesday following. In the meantime, the prisoners would remain in Holloway Jail, where Lord Coleridge remarked they would be most comfortably treated. The prisoners were brought before the Chief Justice in Queen's Bench Division on Tuesday to receive sentence for the murder of the lad Richard Parker on the high seas. When asked if they had anything to say against their sentence, the prisoners threw themselves on the mercy of the court. Sentence of death was passed. The prisoners were removed to Holloway Jail, and it is stated that the Home Secretary had advised the Queen to respite the sentence. Justice is upheld in the strictest sense of the law, but the moral ambiguity of the case caused a great deal of consternation with the public and the press. The timing was important as well. The Greeley case was still in the public imagination. It was universally applauded when their sentence was commuted to six months imprisonment. From the Weekly Dispatch, London, the 21st of December, 1884, the Minionette Case. On Saturday, Dudley and Stevens were informed that their sentences 
had been commuted to six months' imprisonment. They were not surprised, and appeared to expect that some punishment would be inflicted upon them. They will not now be allowed to receive visitors and will be removed to the criminal side of the jail, pending their transfer to some prison not yet made known. Both men are well. Dudley and Stevens remain in confinement at Holloway. Mrs Dudley on Tuesday received the following from Lieutenant Colonel Millman, the governor of the jail, in reply to a letter that she had addressed to him. In reply to your letter of the 13th inst, I have to inform you that your husband still remains in my custody. I am unable to give you any information as to his future abode, but should he be removed to another prison, you would, accordingly to the usual practice, be informed of the transfer. With regard to correspondence, you will not be permitted under the prison rules to communicate with your husband until he shall have served three months of his sentence. He will then be entitled to receive one letter and write a letter in reply, and to receive a visit or not more than twenty minutes duration, not more than two visitors being present. Postscript. The case remains an important one in British law. Dudley reportedly was upset with the six-month imprisonment. Both Dudley and Stevens were released from prison in May 1885. We have no further information of them. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, Murder and Cannibalism. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.